let's get started. First of all, I'm Lucas Cherry, and with me is Lisa Cherry. We have authored Not Open, Win the Invisible Spiritual Culture War. And Mom, we've we've been um, working with Frontline Family Ministries for the la- for many years now. And what is our what's our conference call about today? Uh, today's call is what to do when leaders fall. When leaders fall. When I say leaders fall, what do you think of, Luke? I usually think of some type of a moral failure and some type of a Christian leader. Yeah, that's what I think of. I don't like it much. How about you? <laughs> when I see no, I people hate who it. love Jesus who have some sort of a falling in their life. And, uh, you know, I guess I guess we've had some personal experience of that, of just people we've known close to us who have been serving the Lord and uh, really had a testimony that we admired, and, and then they got into some kind of trouble and, and fell. And it breaks your heart. It just really does. I think the reason we want to talk about it today is that it's not just a sad situation, but it's actually part of this battle that we're enduring right now in the body of Christ because the enemy likes to lo- use our own weaknesses against us. And um, so what, what do you think some of the reason is we chose that for our topic? What's the danger of the fact that, that uh, someone could fall and it could be a, a problem not only for them and their ministry but for others as well? Well, first of all, whenever I see someone um, have sub, some type of a fallout, whether it be a whether it be um, some type of misconduct or a moral failure or a sexual sin, it immediately first thing to me it immediately I'm tempted to become angry. But then my next mm-hmm. response is it's very humbling to me to look and yeah. see that these are these are uh, people that have usually been in ministry for a long time who have uh, many other people underneath them in their ministry and have have ministered to a lot of people across the country and across the world and so as soon as I hear that it really hits a it hits a very soft spot in my heart because I know what it's like to be in ministry and I know the pressures that face those that that are in ministry and so first of all I'm tempted to become angry at the person but I've uh-huh. learned that I, I have to, first of all, ask myself and, and, and look inwardly at myself to, to take, look at this through the eyes of humility, to realize that we must be careful. It says in the Word of God that we must um, take heed where you stand lest you fall. And it's so easy with the pressures that we see in our culture every day to get tripped up by some of the tactics of the enemies. And so it's very sure. it's very humbling for me personally. Uh, I think you're, you're hitting on some good points there. Number one, it, it requires a response on the inside of us because we have, to, we have to deal with it just in our own person. We have to go through sometimes what I find is a grief response. Um, I know I, I knew someone just recently who fell in, in their ministry, and I didn't know them personally, but it was someone that I had received so much from. And, I almost felt like something died, and and I was, you know, like you go through the same shock of when um, something has been taken away, and so it hits a, it hits the other believers around the person who's fallen very hard, and it stirs up a lot of emotions, some of which are not very pretty, <laughs> some of which are just part of, I think, dealing with the trauma, and some of which we need to quickly move on through so that we don't act out of a erroneous emotions that can lead us astray. So I thought it would be really good for us to spend a few minutes talking about what do we do in our families, among our church body, uh, among those that we care about, as we wrestle through. We know we're living in very perilous times. And Matthew 24 says that in, in the last days that men's hearts will fail them because of the increase of wickedness. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of shaking going on in the body of Christ, and some precious people are getting caught up. And, um, and as that happens, our children are asking questions. I know this happened um, a few years ago. I remember a, a person in our, in our sphere of influence fell into sin, and it really shook some of your siblings, Lucas. I mean, they were asking tough questions. How could this be? Um, how, what went wrong? And I could see, as I looked in their eyes, a place that I as a parent need to help um, the people who are under me, or as a church leader, the people under me, to wrestle through this, lest they become embittered, or they get confused, thinking that because a person fell, 
it means that the word of God is no longer true, that they were preaching. And, um, in fact, I've seen this listed as one of the dominant reasons that young people um, will, will pick as their reason that they're staying away from the church. They think that it's full of hypocrites. They full, think that, well, really, you know, there's no moral standard. Everybody's just playing with rules. Um, and so can you see that as a danger in our world, too, that people, that the enemy, again, would not only move in and hurt an individual and their, and their ministry, but hurt the rest of us at the same time? Do you see any evidence of that in, in, in your generation, Luke? Definitely. I, I even see that in my own life as I see specific leaders that may have taught specific areas that I've greatly gleaned from that have helped to develop me into who I am today. And then whenever I see whenever I see that leader fall or have some type of an issue, immediately I begin to question everything that they have taught or everything that I've yes. learned from them. And so yes. I know that I've had to even struggle with that in my own life to not just throw out the baby with the bathwater, you know, that whenever mm-hmm, whenever something mm-hmm. whenever someone falls or whenever there's an issue going on, that I still have to look at it's not it doesn't always mean and this is the the very difficult part, it doesn't always mean that everything they have taught has been a lie. Correct. And that's yes. something that's something that I think is easy to sometimes just throw everything out that they've ever taught and just said, Well that must have just been heresy. Well, not necessarily. You know, there could have been some issues going on, but but usually what happens is people are following after God. They they have a lot of the stuff in place, and they're really helping people grow in their faith, but then something along the way trips them up, and usually it comes through a place where a blind spot, you know, whether it is, whether it is something mm-hmm. that they have had in their past before, before they came to Christ and they haven't been able to correctly deal with it or whether they get so busy with the ministry that they don't have proper accountability systems in place within their ministry. And so for me, I think that it's very it's a very key issue. And I think for me personally, it comes down to, and it reminds me that I cannot put my faith in man. And I cannot yes. put my faith in, in people while, yeah, while let's talk, I want... yeah, let's talk about that a little bit because, um, you know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. We, we, we teach within um, our modern church, we teach the concept of mentorship or discipleship. And so yes. I think this is where I've, I've been really concerned that uh, a distrust would come in us as believers and we would become – almost like isolationist. We don't want to trust anybody anymore. We don't think that people are able to stand, so we're all just going to, you know, pull back from each other. And so, again, we need to recognize we are in an invisible spiritual culture war right now. We are in heavy spiritual battle going on uh, in our world today and in the body of Christ. And so when someone who's in leadership makes an error, falls into sin, it's extremely painful, it's embarrassing, and, yes, it does give the world cause to ridicule, uh, and that's unfortunate. But the worst case is if we then cooperate with the enemy's plan is and basically let it destroy the rest of us too. That would be just what he's after. So you you hit on two or three things I want to pull out there. Number one, it is appropriate when someone, um, it it, maybe something comes out and you find out that they've been in a a longstanding sin. Now that to me is more difficult, is if I find out that actually, They've been in this sin problem for 15 years, and maybe they've even been corrected for it, and they wouldn't ever get any help, and now somebody found out and they brought it to the light. You know, that, that's, that's pretty serious stuff because now you figure somehow that leader learned to do a double life. They learned to, um, to live with a great deal of deception. That's probably even more serious than someone who, you know, discovered they were in sin, immediately woke up, came and brought it publicly, you know, before their church body and they sought help but either one of those cases it's entirely possible and this is the part that's tricky it's entirely possible that their own sin could have affected their teaching i'm smart enough to know that luke you know what i mean it's almost like we have to be willing to square that up and say you know that's possible but you know what we shouldn't be afraid of that because we have a standard it's called the word of god and so if we take that teaching that, that we've been mentored in and we take it right back to the Word of God, we can clearly know that if it's founded on the Word, it will stand even when men fall. Now, if it's, if yes. it's something that's kind of out on the fringe, 
and maybe you can say, wow, I don't really see that in the Word, then then before you toss it out, you're going to have to take it back to the Holy Spirit and say, is there something in here that I need to be willing to look at? Because, you know, honesty, you know, what, where does the enemy want to work? He wants to work in lies and in hiding. And so it's almost like if he can get us in lies or hiding in any direction, he can keep us vulnerable. And I know just recently a, a, a very prominent man fell in, uh, in sin, and, uh, you know, a lot of confusion came breaking through in people who had been sitting under his leadership. And, and I heard some people going to the extreme and saying, well, I'm cashing everything in. Now, that's just cooperating with the enemy's plan. But then I heard some other people who just wanted to go into what I would call a denial state. They refused to believe that this person could have done anything wrong. Now, what strikes you as dangerous about that one, Luke? Well, it makes me think of that scripture in John where it says, Jesus would not entrust himself to anyone, for he knew all people. Mm-hmm. And so, so as soon as we put our faith in the ability of man, whether it's in our own strength or someone else's strength, then that's a dangerous mm-hmm. place because we've elevated them higher than what we're supposed to. And I, yes. I, I we have to be careful. Mm-hmm. I think I have to be careful when I say that because I'm not saying that we can't come under people's mentorship, under people's spiritual authority, and truly glean just amazing amounts of of direction from them and and training. But at the same time, we have to follow them as they follow Christ. And then as soon as they're not following Christ, then we're not following the the actions of that person any longer. And I think that's something that we constantly have to be... um, kind of back to this issue of judging. You know, I think that's a place where, where we as Christians are called to make a righteous judgment in a situation. And so we must be willing to face the truth in these yes. situations. We must be willing to know and understand that the truth will set us free. So we need to get down to really what is the truth, what is really going on in the situation, and then shine the light because it says that light casts out darkness. And, and mm-hmm. what fellowship mm-hmm. can light have with darkness? They cannot, they cannot um, coexist among each other, light and darkness. And so that's yes. something also that something that I have to remind in my own life is I have to leave every little nook and cranny of my life out into the light. As soon mm-hmm. as, as soon as there is something that I'm beginning to want to keep secretive, then I've got to question myself. Why am I? Why is it something that I? trying to keep from other people knowing. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and those that's, are that's those really are places good. those are places I think that you can begin to get tripped up in is and I've had to deal with these just in the last few weeks of, you know, where where are these lines drawn and I think anything that is anything that's done in darkness is going to be brought out into the light. And that is just I, the principle. I think we're that seeing God that, right? Up. Yeah, I think we're seeing it, right? Acted out on center stage of life in front of us. And so, you know, let's just be clear here now. If somebody just joined us, we need to have a heart of compassion. We need to have a heart of restoration toward anyone yes. in the body of Christ who has fallen. I don't care if they're a leader or a follower. We, you know, Jesus is always in the restoration business. And, uh, and the way you get restored is you go through the hard thing, which is to face the truth. I know when Kalen... Um, you know, who your, your sister, her older sister, that was caught up in a, a very tricky case of sexual abuse. And for um, quite a while, we were in a difficult situation where a 46-year-old man had lured her at 15 into an uh, abusive relationship. And for a while, when we brought it to the light, we found out about it through a phone bill, so it was like glaringly obvious this is going on. She wanted to solve the problem by going into denial. She wanted to just pretend that dad and I were ridiculous and that the man was the hero, that he was going to come and this is somehow going to all work out. And, I, you know, as we went through that experience, we lived nine months with her in a place of what I would call kooky denial, where she wanted to wish away the problem. And I learned something um, of walking through with someone who's truly deceived. I kind of thought, Luke, that if I, you know how I am, I'm a talker, right? <laughs> Yes. I kind of thought if I, I thought if I just brought her in my bedroom and we set her down, I could talk her out of this confusion. You know, I could just, I could just get this all in the light. We could talk about it. and We could all get back to life. 
And I found out that's where I really came to understand we are truly in an invisible spiritual war, culture war. In other words, when, it, when someone has been taken captive in darkness, there can be a season of time where they cannot see the truth. And, and hopefully, as quickly as possible, we want to, those that are in the business of restoration around them, we want to present the truth to them because we know on the other side of the truth is their healing. And it's interesting, as soon right. as he finally, finally, after nine months of just trying to pretend this didn't happen, as soon as one day she said, okay, Dad, I want to tell you what happened, you know, that was the beginning of her healing. And so we need to understand that denial is never our friend, even if it hurts our heart. You know what, I was kind of like her. I wanted to wish and pretend it didn't happen. And that's usually what the enemy will try to get us to do. He'll want us to hide and pretend our sin didn't happen. So, you know, we can courageously in the body of Christ, I think we need to, to choose that we're going to keep everything in the light. And should somebody in our, in our sphere of influence or, or someone who is over us in leadership, should they fall, we're right there going to say, okay, Lord, let's get to the restoration. Let's get to the healing. Now, on the flip side, restoration is a process. And, and uh, you know, just in, in this, some situations, you may not be able to be restored back to where you used to be. That's an unfortunate fact of life, you know. Some people spend their whole life in prison for some kinds of falling, and, and so they can't get back. But you know what? They can get back to God, and they can get their healing. And so we're always on the side of restoration, though we're on the side that also delves, you know, delves in deep to the truth. Does that make sense, Luke? Yes, it does, and I think I think we have to remind ourselves that um, God is not limited by man, and that's something mm-hmm. that I I really got to a place in my heart that I had to realize is that God is not limited by my my by my weaknesses, and He can still use sinners and people who make mistakes to bring them back into restoration. You know, we see the issue of Peter; he denied Jesus three times, and then Jesus. Um, still used him to bring about the early church. We see yeah. David after he fell into sin with the Bathsheba, and then God brought restoration through that, but that mm-hmm. was even still mm-hmm. a process. We saw that David was still mourning and grieving over that um, years later as we see him writing continually in the Psalms. And yeah. then we see... Um, and you see the unfortunate, the unfortunate reality that his son died. You know, it, right. it wasn't a pretty story. Death happens in some, you know, death of things around us can happen when we choose darkness. It's just, it's, it's a byproduct of sin. But he didn't give up. He brought his heart yeah. back to the Lord. So go ahead. Who else That's can right. we think of? Mom, as, mm-hmm. as I think we want to go to our um, listeners here. But one thing I wanted yeah. to also bring up is we had, we had someone comment in on our Facebook this week saying, is mm-hmm. there, that we're saying that there is a difference between whenever a person comes forward with some type of an issue in their life and they're seeking help or when mm-hmm. they're being found out, um, you know, yes. whether when someone else brings it forward. And I think that's something that is, that is very different is seeing that whenever people fall into sin, if they, if they immediately re- recognize the sin and they immediately bring it out into the light, then that, that shows now while we still have to deal with the sin and we still have to deal with the consequences of the sin, that shows that the heart is still there in the right place for restoration, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. but I, mm-hmm. I know it's it's difficult whenever we see situations where people have been in leadership, like you said, and something has gone on for years, and then a third party or someone else is the one that brings it into the light. Then I think just naturally that causes us to have to question what are, what are, what's in the heart of the person, not necessarily yeah. just what's in the action, but what is at the heart, because it says you know that from the heart the mouth speaks. Mm-hmm. So let, let's mm-hmm. let's go to our um, listeners. I'm going to go ahead and open up the lines for um, open conference mode. Just one second. All right. Okay, we are in um, open conference mode. Are there any listeners or callers that have any questions or comments they'd like to bring into the conversation? Yeah, I'm. This is Jessica from Michigan. Hi, Hi Jessica. Jessica. How are you? Hey, guys. I'm doing real good. Good. Um, as you were talking, just man, the Holy Spirit was bringing me several things that I've I've learned from different teachings all at once, and um, one of them is about humility. And um, you brought up Peter. You know, Peter denied Jesus three times. 
And Jesus told him he was going to do it, and, and Peter denied the fact that he would do it. And um, I'm sorry, I'm driving down the road if you can hear the background noise. Um, green road's up That's here. That's all right. Um, anyways, Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter was like, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that, Lord. He was proud. And then um, Jesus said, but you know what? I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And though the enemies come to sift you, your faith mm. will not fail. And when you return, you'll strengthen the brethren. Mm. And um, and he had a very humbling experience, you know, because he did he did deny Jesus. And um, that was a huge guilt thing for him. But like you said, Lucas, um it was obvious that he did love the Lord and his heart was in the right place because he did return. He was humble and um, brought to his knees, so to say. But um, when he returned, you see him on the day of Pentecost standing up and and declaring the word of the Lord and reminding everyone about the prophet Joel, you know. So, you know, we can't necessarily discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart, like God, you know, that's God's job. However, Mm -hmm. um, I think we talked about it last week, you know, read the fruit on the tree. You got to be able to see a proving time and and allow people to live their life. And, you know, we can't, we uh, can't judge what other people are facing. We have to Mm -hmm. allow them to be humans in the middle of that. And I, I can speak this for coming from a pastor's kid point of view too i i went through my own battle and as a teenager not as extreme as you know having a 45 year old male relationship but being in my own battle you know people really um judged me severely on that and um the reality was i was in a battle and um and now that i've come out on the other side of it and i and the lord's done a work in my life and and he's brought about good things in my life. And the people that were involved in my life during that bad time when I was sinning are now coming to me and seeing the, the, the life that I'm living and saying, please help me. My kids are facing this. How do I, how do I handle this? My, you know, my ex-husband, he passed away, and my kids are grieving. Help me help them. You know, so coming from a a standpoint of I've lived this out too. I mean, I didn't have some major sin in front of millions of people, but you know, you've got to allow people to live their life. And like you said, follow them as they follow Christ. If they stop following Christ, if you, if you see somebody that's not living their life according to the word of God, don't follow them. Yeah. Pray for them. Pray for their soul. And, and, you know, stay rooted and grounded in love. I think that's the biggest thing. If we got to mm-hmm. focus on our own walk with the Lord and and have the heart of love towards other people. You know, everyone's in their own battle. Yeah, that's, yeah. you've got a lot of good points in there. I think you're, um, you're talking about something that's kind of a, another cousin to what we've been saying here. And, and there's a cost in the, in the body of Christ to being in leadership. And that's something that Lucas and I were talking about just recently. Of, it says in the scriptures that teachers will be judged more severely. Wow, that will get you going. What does that mean? Well, I think, oh, yeah. I think that means that when you, when you aspire to be a leader uh, of some sort in the body of Christ, you're allowing your fruit to be in public inspection. <laughs> And we all know we're vulnerable. You know, we can err. Now, maintaining a heart on the inside of us that can be that can be corrected, maintaining a teachable spirit is absolutely vital in this hour. And yeah. I don't care whether you're just you know, you're teaching in the nursery class or you know you're leading millions. <laughs> we have yeah. to be teachable because the enemy is um, throwing a lot of strange, deceptive arrows at us. So teachability. Um, and I think, you know, you, you talked about that season of restoration. Um, I, I think it's real important. I want to put kind of this, this in here just to make sure we're making sure everybody's balanced on this, is I do believe that God wants to restore leaders who have fallen. I do think it's extremely important that they follow a very wise and slow and cautious and well-accountable, uh, lots of accountability system of restoration because, unfortunately, what happens is 
when someone falls, they, of course, want to get brushed off and get back up to the line again. But um, they've got to, to be firmly in the word. And, and sometimes it may mean that they can't go right back to what they were doing. Sometimes yeah. there's places where you've disqualified yourself. And, you know, that's a scary thought. But, you know, yeah. that also should cause the fear of the Lord and leaders <laughs> to say, yeah. you know, I, 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 I don't know that I can get back from adultery. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, think yeah. I think that's probably an appropriate boundary. I, I kind of, I, not that I, I feel like I'm intended on that one, but I think that knowing that you can blow your life up, you know, <laughs> with, this, with wrong kind of steps is kind of one of those things that I want my children to know that if you touch the stove, it's hot. And there's some of those those boundary lines. So we need a lot of wisdom in the body of Christ to deal with leaders. We need a lot of compassion for families. And here's the other thing I want to bring up, too. You had to allow that restoration process to mature you so that you could turn and be a help to others. So you probably have a sensitivity to the traps that oh, yeah. sometimes when you haven't been. So we also need to listen to people who've fallen. Um, you know, when Kaylin came out of her deception, she taught me an awful lot about deception. And so, you know, yes. God can redeem every part of a fall. He can redeem it in the person's life, but he can even redeem it in the body of Christ to say, where do we need to make a change here? Where do we need to provide more support to our leaders? Where do we need to provide more protection? You know, is it wise ever to have um, people alone in counseling situations with opposite right. gender, you know, things like that. So, so when a fall happens, it's appropriate for us to take a peek in to the situation and say, how can we do better in the body of Christ to protect one another? And it sounds like you had some help with that. You probably oh, now yeah. can even tell people, don't do this. There's a trap over there, you know. So yeah. I want to listen to people who've fallen once they get their head on straight again. And I want to hear, how did this happen? Because I don't want to go that way. <laughs> you know, I want to learn and have the wisdom. Yeah. Yes, and Mom, <clears throat> I think that something that can help us, for those of us that are, are in leadership positions, is we have to make sure that we have put in place around us a, a good accountability system, that whenever we begin to move off or veer off or even get caught into sin, that there are natural boundaries to catch us and stop us mm-hmm. quickly. And mm-hmm. and I, mm-hmm. I think that I think that, that is where the humility comes into is that oftentimes you may get to a certain level or a certain flow and this is just something that's convicting me right now is just getting into a place where you kind of feel like, Oh, well I've already dealt with this temptation and I'm kind of over that temptation. Well, that's a that's a dangerous place because that's when yeah. the enemy can can begin to move in and so I, I think of I think of yeah. um a man, you know, that we have heard a story about who is who is very well known in ministry and was sent to prison for for a fall, for a moral failure, for sin he got involved in. And someone asked him, you know, when did when did you stop loving God that you could continue in this sin for so long? Because they'd gone on for a while without without it being brought out into the light. And he said, I never lost my love for the Lord. He said, I had lost the fear of the Lord. He said, I love mm. God. And I think that's mm-hmm. something that we mm-hmm. have to we have to keep in the right in the right boundaries is that you can you can still love God and be deceived. And yes, so you can. we must we must constantly be be lining up our lives, be um really allowing the Lord to do what David did after he had after he had been caught in sin, you know, it's, it was a vulnerable time in his life and it says in Psalms one thirty nine, it says, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart, test yeah. me and see if there's any way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, that's yes. a prayer that I yes. that I pray often, very often. Mm-hmm. God, mm-hmm. catch me, Lord. See see areas in my heart that are beginning to, to go astray, that are beginning to be caught up by some of the pressures of this world that we're living in. And then, and, and mm-hmm. then he didn't just say, test me, but he said, lead me in the way everlasting. Purge it out of us. And I think that yes. we have to... We have to be in a place that, you know, we see kind of the age-old saying that hurting people hurt people. Mm-hmm. And so whenever, mm-hmm. whenever people fall into sin, whenever they fall into uh, a, a moral failure, you know, there's that balance that, that we have to make sure that the, the restoration is complete before we put them out into battle. You know, whenever we talk about also of, you know, it's frontline family ministries, you, you know, the invisible spiritual culture war, that whenever it's, someone is in a battle, you know, Jessica, like what you were saying, when you were in a battle, there was a certain season where where you couldn't, while you were in that battle, 
it wasn't it wasn't time for you to go and fight other battles and help other people fight their battles. You just right. need to fight the battle that you were in right then. And so sometimes mm-hmm. I think there's mm-hmm. that season whenever there is a moral failure that we need to help people to fight their battle that they're in to bring that restoration before we just throw them back out into other people's battles or into other battles that they that that they would have maybe been fighting prior. And so I think that there's that yeah. season of time that whenever someone falls into um, some type of a moral failure that we bring that restoration, but it's through a process and a healing of the Holy Spirit and through the system of accountability. Yes. Um, I, I think we've, we've come now to, to the end of our time, and I really believe right now is the time to pray. It's a time yes. to pray for our leaders. It's a time to to pray for those that uh, might right now be in temptation. You know, I, I just I'm just amazed that the enemy will often allow things to stay in our life until an opportune time. And that's, I, I, ha, I know years ago somebody who had been a seasoned minister explained that. He said, you know, something can be sitting in there, and what the enemy would like to do is destroy as many lives as possible. <laughs> you know, while he takes you down, just go ahead and pull a few people down with him. And so there could be leaders right now that have some issues in their life that right now the Lord wants to uh, address quickly before they go any further. And, you know, I want to uh, personally just submit myself afresh to God, pray for the restoration. Um, I also just am going to pray for an accountability system in the body of Christ. We need that right now so much. We need to be um, lovingly watching our each other so that if we see something, we have the courage to speak up. And, and you know, have the courage also that certain types of sin, wow, you just need to keep that person out of that place of vulnerability. I mean, I, I would not send uh, a man who struggled with alcohol back to minister in the bars. You know, that just wouldn't be that wouldn't be a, a wise thing to do. Um, and there's some people in, in our midst that need to have somebody leading them to a place where they can have a, a place to stand. A sexual predator yes. does not go back to children's ministry. You know, I mean, we just yeah. there's just boundaries. So we need a lot of wisdom, a lot of discernment. So, Father, we just come to you. Lord, we're, we have broken hearts for those of us who have been wounded, those who have been hurt, those, Father, who have willfully um, turned away from you, God, and yet deep in their heart they don't want to turn away. They've been tricked. Father, would you come to our leaders that are broken right now? Would you come to those of us who uh, who right now might have secret things that are that are needing to be brought to the light? Father, we want your light. We want your, your mercy and your grace to fall on us with conviction right now so that, Lord, we would not cause any of the little ones to sin around us. Father, we know that the enemy is, is sifting through leaders right now. And, Lord, it's just almost embarrassing when we open the, 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 uh, the emails up and we see, oh, no, somebody else fell into sin. Lord, it has to be hurting us, but, Lord, how much more it's hurting you. Father, we yes. pray for a heart of compassion one to another that we would respond in truth that we would respond in honesty, that we would respond in love, in a heart of restoration, and also, Father, just an amazing protection system that people would be able to walk free from their sin on their way back out. Now, God, I I pray for our families. I pray for our children. Lord, when they see things like this, it can be a, a, a stumbling block to them. Father, give us wisdom as parents and as leaders to explain this, that, Lord, we would not do... Um, something silly like to think that everybody's perfect around us. And yet, Father, we would also not do something silly saying, I can't trust anybody. Well, that's going to have to be by your spirit. So keep us rightly balanced and understanding how to trust you and to love people. And, Lord, we give you praise for that because, Lord, we are just desperate for a move of your spirit in our homes, in our schools, in our workplace. And so we ask you, Father, to start with each of us personally. We humble ourselves before you in Jesus' name. Search our hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this evening. Join us next week on Tuesday at 530 Central and 630 Eastern Standard Number at the same number. We'll also be posting this on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash frontlinefamilies. Also, Lisa has written um, a blog post about this on her blog at frontlinefamilies.org. You can find an article with some of the things we've been talking about with scripture references and, and other places to point you towards. And we look forward to being with you again next week. Follow us on Facebook at 
I'm not open, and share your um, questions and comments there as we prepare for next week's message. Have a blessed evening, and we will see you next week.